15. We're back. We're live. We're here at the one o'clock rock <laughs> research in Manoa. We like to find out what's going on in Manoa. We like to talk to people in SOAS. That's the School of Ocean and Earth Science and Technology and HIGP, the Hawaii Institute of Geophysics and Planetology and Seymour, the Center for Microbial Oceanography Research and Education. And today we have a special guest. Uh, we have Amber Imai Hong, it's hyphenated, <laughs> and she is an avionics person at the Hawaii Space Flight Laboratory at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. We have real science there, you know? It's really <laughs> fabulous. So what is, what is the Space Laboratory? Tell us what that organization is. Um, it is a, um, a way for people who are studying at Manoa um, to learn more about space science. Um, we collaborate between the College of Engineering and the School of Ocean and Earth Science and Technology. So we have both engineers and scientists that work at HSFL, and we design small satellites there. It reminds me of that song in Oklahoma, can the uh, farmers and cowboys be friends? <laughs> can the engineers and the scientists be friends? Oh, yeah. In every scientist is an engineer, and in every engineer this is a scientist. Do you agree with that? Yes. <laughs> okay. So what, is it, what do you do, though, at the Hawaii Space Flight Laboratory? Um, so I primarily work on instrumentation. I work on um, designing sensors, and I work very closely with the scientists. But I also do K through 12 outreach um, with the Hawaii Space Grant Consortium, and I also work with the community colleges as well. Okay, what is outreach now exactly? So it's like working with other people to bring science into their lives, or trying to teach them more about um, kind of the cool stuff that we do. Okay. Because um, space is always really cool, and it's fun to learn about. So, uh, what, so you go, you talk to kids in school then, and kids in college also. Yeah, well, so for the kids in school, I bring like a science kit out and I have them learn about science hands-on. Um, so I talk about Landsat, which is um, the longest running Earth observing satellite program in the US um, and we're funded through USGS. Um, I go and I teach them about light and heat and what all of that has to do with satellites and how they can learn more about the Earth that we live in. Um, through satellite technology and we can learn about um, kind of just some of the things that um, we can do that's really cool both planetary and just learning about our own home planet. Um, for the community college I work on um, building small payloads that go on sounding rockets so they go into space for just a very short amount of time. Do it with with the students? Yeah so I'm like their mentor. in the backyard in the back of the <laughs> no, there? no, a little bit bigger than that. Okay. So um, the sounding rocket payloads that we've been working on, um, they will experience um, weightlessness and they'll experience space for about five to seven minutes before they come back to Earth. Um, so I worked with Project Dimua um, for two years um, with Windward, Kapiolani, Honolulu, and Kauai Community Colleges. Um, and we got to launch our payloads um, last August and this August um, from Wallop Flight Facility. Where is that? Virginia. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. they go there? Yeah, so oh, we wow. flew a group of students over and one of the pictures they sent over was um, us with the rocket. And um, last year's experiment did very well. We were happy with the results. Um, this year's rocket, however, we weren't able to recover it, so it's sitting somewhere deep in the uh, in the Atlantic. Oh, that's too bad. Yeah. And now you have to get another one. Yeah. Yeah, so they're currently working on year three of that project. Yeah. So what, what, what kind of, how big is the rocket? What kind of rocket is this? Is this um, an expensive rocket? All rockets are expensive. Yeah. Yes, all rockets are very expensive. Um, it was a NASA experimental like rocket. Like this? Yes, that one. Okay. Um, so that's us in front of it. It's a Terrier rocket. Um, it's relatively small compared to what we've been working on um, but we had a lot of fun and this this was supposed to experience um, space for about five to seven minutes before it came back down um, because it was experimental NASA didn't charge us as much but also there's an increase for the amount of failure that could happen mm -hmm. so that uh, they had been very lucky the Rocksat program had been very lucky up until that point <laughs> um, they hadn't lost a single <laughs> racket but for sounding rackets um, about 
uh, 80 to 90 percent success rate is very high. Yeah. Um, and we had a hundred percent success rate up until <laughs> this August. So. Um, well, too bad. It was unfortunate, but we're hoping that this year's racket will. Yeah, so, we're, we're, uh, we're, who owns these rackets? Um, so that one was a NASA project. So it was um, NASA kind of fronted most of the money, um, but the program, the Rocksat program itself, was put on by the Colorado Space Grant Consortium. Oh, okay. So we partner with other space grant consortiums as well to kind of do bigger projects. And okay. Colorado is one of the big ones who works with um, college students to get them to do like. Um, space programs where they launch a payload into space, whereas we fund um, various research projects okay. at UH. So, um, you know, space education is really interesting, uh, especially now. Um, I, I don't think that, uh, that Donald Trump, when he was running for office, was, was talking about doing support for the space program. In fact, I think he said something just to the contrary of that. Yeah, yeah. it's a very interesting and kind of scary time for us, yeah. um, but it is a scary time for all researchers at UH. And all Americans. Yes. And maybe <laughs> everyone in the world, but hey, <laughs> I guess that's the way it works. Yep. We're yeah. <laughs> just trying to struggle on. We do need to have a science-aware community, and that's part of the reason that I really try to push science in um, classrooms is because I... Um, a lot of my teachers were afraid of science and I want to support those teachers who may not be comfortable teaching the science to their students um, but I'd like to come in and just if they're willing to come into their classrooms and kind of talk to them about what I know and what I've learned um, and I was very lucky to have um, great mentors and people to kind of teach me about different things in the science world and get me very interested in um, science and space science at a very young age. Well, let's talk about that. <laughs> you had an epiphany of some sort. You woke up one morning and you told your parents, I think I gotta go into science. I know this is my <laughs> life. What happened? Um, so when I was really little, I wanted to be an astronomer. Um, I think in preschool I had told my parents that. Really? Uh, that yeah. Way back. <laughs> and then I realized that astronomers needed to get like a PhD and I was terrible at school. So I decided that that was not the route I was going to take. Um, but somewhere around seventh grade I think I realized that engineering was a really cool field. Um, my mom's been in a wheelchair since I was about eight years old. Um, so I kind of wanted to go into biomedical engineering. Um, and going through high school and stuff, I joined the robotics club. Um, I did all kinds of like electron marathon, building electric cars, and trying to just like tinker with things. Wow, you were really <laughs> in inspired, eh? Yeah, wanted I really <laughs> wanted to do. Um, I I wanted to do something. I was very good with my hands. I'm pretty awful at school. Yeah. Uh, I grew up on the Big Island, <laughs> and where? Um, in Kao. Okay, oh. I'm from Kao. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So um, it was tough and it was really challenging but I really wanted to do it and I was very determined um, some of my elementary school teachers said like oh you know you've got learning disorders you're never gonna make it and I told them like you know what I'm gonna prove you wrong and so that was kind of like the driving force all through um, K through 12 um, was like trying to be the person that I the best person I could be um, and That's trying to Hilo high school YK oh YK oh yes. okay okay so I was well, part I've of the been robotics there. I know team. That school, or, yeah, yeah. Um, and then in my senior year, I had applied for a bunch of colleges, and my parents literally laughed at me, and they were like, "There is no way you're going to a four-year school." And I was like, "Why are you laughing at me? You should be proud of me." But they were like, "No, you're. I don't believe that you're actually going to go." So I came to Manoa. And it took me five and a half years, but I got my bachelor's degree in electrical engineering. Um, and all of that was... Good I've, choice of fields, really. <laughs> <laughs> it was the only one that had a lot of labs in it. Okay. So a lot of hands-on. Yeah. I was, like you said, I'm You're really a bad at... engineer, I can Bad tell. at theory, <laughs> great at doing hands-on stuff. Yeah. So I worked really hard at that. Um, and with that, my ultimate goal was to be an instrumentation engineer at the... Um, at one of the observatories back mm -hmm. home. Mm -hmm. My goal has always been to move back to Hilo so that I can give back to the community that has given me so much. Um, and 
it was really challenging to find like um, internships and stuff that were very hands-on. But every summer, I made sure that I interned somewhere new so that I got a feel for the different fields. Um, I got to intern... Around the telescopes there in Kamawila? Yeah, so I interned as a high schooler at um, Joint Astronomy Center, uh -huh. and I did like a programming project for them. Uh -huh. And after my freshman year of college, I went to Canada, France on an Akamai Workforce in Initiative. Kamawila. Yeah, okay. and I loved it there. Um, and then they said, well, you know, you need to get better at circuit design, you need to get better at programming. And I had already been part of um, UH's satellite program, um, or small sat program, with Dr. Wayne Sharoma for, at that point, about a year. I had gotten involved in it on, like, day three of college. So uh, it was a lot you were of all in. I was. I was a very, I'm a very project-based learner. Okay. So um, I... Um, got involved with this project. I did small sets for about three and a half years um, with Dr. Sharoma. I participated in the NanoSat 6 program. Um, I got to intern downtown here um, at an optical engineering firm. Which one? Um, Novasol. Ah, sure. And Novasol in Bishop Square. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, and then I did a few outreach programs where I helped um, create kits for teachers that they could borrow and use in their classrooms. Um, and even my last summer, um, before, right before I graduated, I worked, I started working for HSFL. Um, and I had already been working with, um, Hawaii Space Grant Consortium, um, since my freshman year as a student assistant for Arden Reen Kimura, who are, um, who are the people who started robotics in Hawaii. Um, and they've been great mentors to me throughout my entire life. Art was my um, vice principal in like elementary school. So um, I got to kind of do a lot of these hands-on things. And after I graduated, HSFL picked me up as an um, avionics engineer to continue my work on um, SUCHI, or the super ultra compact hyperspectral imager that Paul Lucy and Rob Wright have been working uh, okay. on. Okay. Well, it, it teaches me a couple of things. One is I. I think the water in uh, Hilo and Kao, <laughs> it's different because there's so many per capita, so many scientists that I have met who have grown up in that area. <laughs> I don't know what it is. And the high schools, you know, are, they're really interested in science and they generate people like you. That's fabulous. <laughs> hey, shout out to Hilo and Kao. Uh, <laughs> the other thing is, the other thing I get out of it is that <laughs> his living proof uh, with Amber, that you don't have to like school to like science, right? <laughs> yes, I was pretty awful at school. I could, I, I'm both dyslexic and ADHD, so I have a hard time focusing on like a lot of schoolwork. And a lot of my teachers, either they loved me or they hated me. It really depended on their teaching style, so it was a lot of fun. <laughs> at the end of the day, the proof is in the pudding, you know? <laughs> We're going to take a short break, Amber. And we come back, we're going to talk turkey. We're going to talk turkey. We're going to talk turkey. I said that. I can't believe I said that. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to talk about avionics. Whoa. We're going to talk about real science when we come back. You'll see. Aloha and welcome to the Savvy Chick Show on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm the weekly host at 11 a.m. Honolulu time. Very excited for the next six weeks. We have the Aspire series, which is all about the coolest careers I could find and interviewing and getting insights from these amazing people who want to share it with you and help you live your dreams. Look forward to seeing you on the show. Aloha. I'm Ethan Allen, host of Likeable Science here on Think Tech Hawaii. Every Friday afternoon at 2 p.m., you'll have a chance to come and listen and learn from scientists around the world. Scientists who talk about their work in meaningful, easy to understand ways. And you'll come to appreciate science as a wonderful way of thinking, way of knowing about the world. You'll learn interesting facts, interesting ideas. You'll be stimulated to think more. Please come join us every Friday afternoon at 2 p.m. here on Think Tech Hawaii for a likable science with me, your host, Ethan Allen. Bingo, we're back. I promised you we'd return like MacArthur, and we came back. And here's uh, Amber Imai Hong. Uh, she is with the Hawaii Space Flight Laboratory at UH Manoa. And we're talking about launching next generation careers to space with Amber Imai Hong. So um, you're an engineer in the avionics field. I guess the first thing that comes to mind is what's avionics? 
What is that? Circuit boards. So um, okay. I do a lot of circuit design um, and then fabrication and, of course, testing. Um, I got to do extensively a lot of subsystem and system level testing for our satellite. Um, that was Hiakasat that we launched um, last November. Okay. What, how do you spell that? Uh, H-I-A-K-A-S-A-T. Okay. Hiakasat. Okay. okay. Yeah. Um, and I had a lot of fun doing that. Um, I always, my whole dream was to have a job that I could go to and say it was fun. Um, yeah. So I got to do a lot of testing and that's like, I feel like a big part of my engineering side of my job is just kind of like making something and that takes a while, but not so long. And then trying to figure out all of the things that could possibly break it or if it's already broken, how to fix it. Oh, wow. You sound like the space, the space central in <laughs> what is it, Houston? Um, but wait, <clears throat> so you, you studied this at the College of Engineering and you studied electrical engineering there, yeah? Yes. So what courses and what disciplines feed into avionics? I guess electrical engineering itself would Elect feed into avionics, but there's more. What else goes into avionics? Um, electrophysics, a lot of stuff I learned on the job or like I learned from robotics. Um, like circuit design and programming. We had a couple programming classes that we were required to take, but not a whole lot. Um, so a lot of it was kind of learning as you go, um, as well as circuit design. You don't have specifically a course about circuit design. We learn like the physics behind circuit design or how a signal gets processed from one point to another, but we don't actually learn like how do I connect all of the dots and what components or what pieces do we put in to make everything like work together um, and we don't have too many classes on that it's more of like a trade school level thing uh -huh, uh -huh. but it was something that I definitely needed to a, a skill that I needed to learn and kind of work on as I um, continue circuit in design life. sounds pretty complicated to me I mean a circuit my god how do you how do you design first you have to design what you want out of it okay then you have to design what pieces are involved what what transistors, what have mm -hmm. you, capacitors, what, all those things. Yep, our and, chips, and then you our have to computers. Connect them and what? Tell me, tell me. So we have all of our chips and computers, and we get our re design requirements from our um, scientists, and they're awesome and crazy and expect a lot out of our um, boards. And then we have to put all these components onto a, um, our board, and all of this is done on the computer. So it's a lot. At first, it looks like spaghetti. And you have to make like a <laughs> diagram of how you're going to connect everything. Yeah, so you can see what you're doing. Yeah, yeah, to create that layout. And then you have like the um, outline of your board. And you have to get all of those pieces to fit like a puzzle in there. And then you have to make sure that um, you don't have like things that are crossed wrong or we're not connecting part A to part C when it was really supposed to be connected to part B. Easy to make a mistake, huh? It's very easy, <laughs> which is why it's pretty fun to try to troubleshoot those things. Because but you can tell with the smoke, right? Oh, yes, definitely. <laughs> white smoke, the magic white smoke is always a telltale <laughs> sign that something went wrong. <laughs> so um, ha then, you have, then you put all the capacitors and what I call it, transistors on the thing. Now you're going to do it with your own hands, right? Hands on, right? You're going to take the design off the computer and you're going to go down to Radio Shack. Well, there is no more Radio Shack. <laughs> go down to a place like Radio Shack and get all the necessary components. Tell me how you do it. Online shopping is a lot of fun Online now. Online is better, <laughs> yeah. okay. So um, because of the parts that we use, we don't typically have all of them in stock on island. So we order from DigiKey or Mauser or some other electronic stores. Um, and we also get our circuits printed because we have multiple layers, um, and that's not really something that UH has the capacity to do right now. Um, so, so you can get the, the actual connections on a circuit yeah, board. Yeah, like those green ones that are in also your Also mail order, yeah. Yep. And then you plug in your components in, well, onto that same board. Then you have board. like a stencil and you put a solder paste onto it, so the glue on, and then you put all the components on, and we don't have like a pick in place, so we don't, we have to do all of that by hand. Uh -huh. And we put it into an oven, and like two minutes later, it makes a noise and you, it pops out, and you have a circuit board that sometimes needs a little bit of tweaking, a little bit of um, cleaning up, because the solder paste just kind of flows wherever it. Okay, so that's one thing like goes wrong. I mean, you could have the solder paste flow in the wrong direction and get a, a short circuit. Yeah. Or something like that. 
But so what, what else can go wrong when, you, when you're testing? What kinds of things are you testing for? And how do you test and how do you find out whether you made a mistake somehow? So a lot of um, what could happen is if you crossed wires or you hooked the wrong thing up to the wrong pins, um, which means that you would have to like cut the trace. And hopefully that trace was on one of the top layers. So you could just cut it with an X-Acto knife, scrape yeah. it off, and solder yeah, yeah. to a different point okay. using like a jump cable. I hope cable. you realize you're getting invaluable information <laughs> <laughs> from Amber today. And this will stand everyone in good stead to understand how to do this. Okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so those are, that's like one of the things that could go wrong. You could have shorted something and not realized it and then plugged it into power and then you smell, of course, the magic white smoke. <laughs> um, so you have to figure out which component is shorted and which one needs to be replaced. Because you burned it up already. Yeah, because you've burned it up already. <laughs> or you figure out like where exactly the problem came from. So a lot of it is once you send out your design and you order all your parts, you stare at your design again and go, where did I possibly go wrong? And you double check everything just to kind of make sure that everything logically makes sense. So, so sometimes the mistake would be in the original design itself. Mm -hmm. You can't be sure that it's going to work because it, it, you saw it on the computer screen. Right? You always have that element of human error. Yeah. <laughs> so you can make an error in the original design or you can make an error in actually connecting the, the, uh, the components up to the right pins on the circuit board. Yeah. Uh, I'm, just another question is you get these components and certain the the r connecting boards call them uh on the mail order but they're not expensive are they you don't have to pay a lot of money for this because it's this is the 21st century right well some of the uh, it depends how many layers your board is so um a four or six layer board cost maybe like 20 or 40 to 60 dollars um with all the pieces with all uh that was just one board just it printed for the components, one component, one tiny little chip that's a, like a computer chip could cost $120. Ooh. Um, so Starts running into money now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it depends how complicated your board is. We're trying to move into FPGAs, What's that? Um, which is like a more um, powerful computer chip. Um, and a lot of phones are using them now. A lot of um, like higher end computers are using them. We're trying to, uh, space technology is always about 10 years behind. So we're trying to bring that space technology a little more into the future. <laughs> so uh, now you, avionics, though, you said avionics was creating circuit boards, but circuit boards for aviation, for space flight? Typically more for um, what we do is small satellites. So it's all those circuit boards for the small satellite um, design. So we've got a computer. Um, we normally order our communication systems because those are a little... Um, we want to make sure our radios work. So our computer can screw up, our, um, like our instrument can be a little weird, but we need to make sure our power and our communications are flawless. So <laughs> we make sure we order those two pieces. We've been kind of trying like different ideas. Um, some people in the military that we've been talking with have said that they do software-defined radios, so we're kind of thinking about doing, going what's, that what's route. What's a software-defined radio? It's using that FPGA, like uh, I was telling you. Very, so very you can, advanced then. Yes. New technologies. Yeah. <laughs> yes. The national labs are doing amazing work with yeah. this technology. So um, we are thinking about incorporating it into some of our next designs. But um, for right now, we have been ordering some some of our parts and making just like our solar panel boards. Right. Um, like instruments. So what I do is I work with scientists and they give me their requirements. Of, like, this is what I want um, this camera to do, but it doesn't do all of those functions yet. So how, uh, I need you to make the controller that will do the calibration system for my camera and stuff. Whoa, and so I, I get to do pretty that. complicated. It's so a lot of fun. Let's <laughs> talk about that as a case study for a minute. So I have a camera. The camera is on the satellite taking pictures and you're going to control what? the the lens uh, aperture and the speed and the focus and what have you, um, maybe the direction of the camera with a circuit board, is that the idea? Well, fortunately for us, most of the cameras that we purchase have all of that controls um, kind of built in, so we just need to interface with them. Okay. So it's just um, kind of creating a board to interface their, their board to our computer system, for example. Um, with Suchi, um, which Such is the, that yeah. was the 
ultra compact hyperspectral imager um, that I worked with um, with Paul Lucy and Rob Radon. Um, also, I worked with Sarah Kreitz, who now works for JAXA in Japan. Um, but um, that one, we needed to build um, the calibration system. So it's a hyperspectral imager. So we needed to take images um, both before and after their um, their lens stack to kind of um, show like any deflection so that we could calibrate the images that were taken. Um, so we had a lens or yeah, like a lens cover that um, we would heat up using Kapton heaters. So we got to play with um, this really expensive thermal paste. So it's basically like epoxy, just a thermally Thermal conductive. paste. Yep. Yeah. And we got to figure out how to not get that thermal paste into the very thin shutters. <laughs> and that was a big challenge, but it was a lot of fun. You um, learned that here on, on Think Think about <laughs> thermal paste. We learned a lot from you. You know, when you started talking about your experience in the schools, I said, she's really focusing on the schools, and it's challenging, and it's valuable, but, you know, that's more important than avionics. Now I feel differently. Now you, <laughs> now you work in avionics, really. You know, you're amazing, Amber. I'm a juggler. I, <laughs> I guess have to so. juggle everything. Do anything and everything. Amber, Amber uh, Imai Han, engineer at the Hawaii Space Flight Laboratory, University of Hawaii at Manoa, you have dazzled us. Thank you so much for coming down. Thank you for having me. It's <laughs> been a pleasure. Aloha. <laughs> Thank you.